my name is Dennis Blumke. Uh, my I, highest rank in the Navy was uh, interior communications electrician, class two, E5. And then the last day of boot camp is when you get uh, your orders as to where you're going. And I thought, okay, here comes, here comes, I'm afraid to look. Well, when it said USS America, and that it was a brand new ship, I thought, and it's an aircraft carrier, I thought, oh, happy days. So, uh, went home on leave for the two weeks and that, and then went back to Great Lakes, and Americos was still out to sea. It was on a bed cruise on its way back. So I had to stay in barracks J-50 for a couple of weeks, waiting for the ship to return. And the crazy thing about <laughs> what I had to do in J-50, waiting for the ship, is they made me the shore patrol of the base. Not, not. Essentially, my job was to escort dishonorably discharged people from the brig to the front gate this billy club. Now, I'm a little guy. <laughs> and I'm escorting these big guys out. And you had to pass the captain's house and it had all these pretty flower beds in front. And I, I, I should have probably not said this to a couple of those guys. I said, you know, don't cut through these flower beds. You stay on the sidewalk with me. Well, they didn't care. Uh, they trampled and busted those flowers up as much as they could till we got to the front gate. So what was I going to do with this billy, stick, billy club? <laughs> Not a whole lot, because he'd probably take it away from me and beat the crap out of me. So, <laughs> so I was glad that two weeks was over with. And then the ship came in and uh, I got on it and right away uh, as the new people on, on the ships do, they go to mess cooking right away. Well, for me that wasn't too bad of a deal because in that one I was assigned to be the milkman and the Kool-Aid guy. So we had the big five gallon bags of white milk and chocolate milk and then had these I don't know, it had to be a hundred gallon size of vats that you stir up the Kool-Aid of the day, whatever flavor it was going to be. But in port, as long as there was fresh milk, uh, the job was kind of hard and, uh, because everyone drank that. And the Kool-Aid wasn't too bad. But from, my, from what I understood, that when the ship goes to sea, and if there are long distances between ports, the fresh milk runs out and you go to this powdered stuff. Well, then your job gets really easy because nobody drinks that milk. <laughs> so you, you do a double time on the Kool-Aid. <laughs> so, uh, so mess cooking was you know, fun for me too. And then I had not been to A school yet because there wasn't enough billets open for I seamen. So the ship sailed again back on another med cruise. So in, during that time, I was taking the tests and reading the books to take these tests to uh, pass to become. Uh, a fireman, and, or I mean a, a three-striper. Yeah, so that went okay, and then I took the test for third class. The ship had returned back uh, to Norfolk, its home port, and I went right from the bat to A school. Well, the first week I was in A school, I sewed on third class. <laughs> people, 
people in A school thought, well, why are you here? <laughs> but that didn't occur until uh, the first week of A school. Well, we had already assigned uh, the class leader who was going to be the leader. So they said, well, no, now Dennis, you have to be the leader. I said, no, he's having a lot of fun doing it. You let him be a leader, I'll just I'll just be the third class that's I don't know, what do you want to call auditing this the whole or ordeal, see if you're teaching it right. <laughs> but, <laughs> no, I learned a lot of a lot of stuff that even though I passed the test for for to become a third class I seaman, uh, I didn't know half the stuff that learned in A school off the books that I studied from on the ship while at, uh, on that med crew. So, so anyway, got off uh, back back on the ship and uh, was working in after I see, and that was a pretty cool shop to work in. But then the alarm shop needed. A person, so they sent me over there, and that was really cool in the fact that the alarm shop had circuits that went all the way from the bilges to the mast. So, and there were certain magazines, the nuclear missile magazines, that you needed a top security clearance. So. They went through the <coughs> excuse me. They went through that process. Took a while for me to get that clearance because we had certain circuits that we had to go into those magazines, mm -hmm. and it was a need to know top secret security clearance. So you couldn't just walk in. You had to be in there for a reason. So that's the need to know why, well, okay, you need to be in here, okay, you can come in here. So, uh, And then all the way up to the mast uh, where the wind speed and direction birds are up there, it tells us wind speed and direction and periodically one of the synchro motors and one of those birds would fail. Well, now you have to go get that thing off that mast. <laughs> so, <laughs> step number one is go to these different radar departments to shut all those things off so that you don't become sterile while you're trying to get that stuff, that bird down. And then, so you get all these forms signed. Okay, we'll secure that radar at 1100 hours. So. You wonder, okay, did they really shut these things off? Why are they still spinning around? So you <laughs> climb the mast, go out on that yard arm. Now you're looking down and you think, oh my word, you know, being on the flight deck, that's a hundred feet. Now you go up that mast and now you're really <laughs> getting nervous. Yeah. So and the idea is that you have a strap that you're going to unbolt that bird and strap it to your back and then climb back down. So, and I, I did, and halfway on the way, uh, halfway down, for some reason, I don't know why, I just froze. So I grabbed onto the mass and just, and I cool it for a while. I said, oh, I, I can't move. <laughs> I just got to cool it. And uh, step by step, I finally made it back down with this big thing that's strapped to my back. And it's not that it was that heavy, but it's just big. Bigger than you think it is. Bigger than me. It's <laughs> and I... Uh, told the guy in FDIC, I think his name was, oh, I don't know, maybe Wayne Walker, I think I said, hey, I can't put this back up there. I cannot go up there. I just can't. 
So they got something else to put it back after we fixed it. So, <laughs> and then, then you got to tell the radar departments, okay, we're done. You can turn the stuff back on. Well, you don't really know that they shut them off until you get married and have kids. <laughs> oh, we had a kid. Oh, they must have shut that stuff off. <laughs> so, but. Uh, the, the Med crews and the uh, Vietnam, the Westpac crews, made it so I went around the world on a beautiful sh new ship. And uh, all expenses paid. <laughs> free laundry, free food. Uh, not too much extra duty. You know, I managed to get in trouble on the beach a few times. but. And only had to go to Camp Mass once, but I got out of it because uh, it was too too frivolous to really bust me. I got I had to stay on the ship for two weeks suspension, so or quarantine or whatever you want to do it. Just can't go anywhere. Want to. Uh, All the ports, you know, Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, uh, Australia, Sydney. What was nice about Sydney and Australia is that after going around the world everywhere else, you didn't have to draw pictures and pantomime as to what you're trying to say. You know, they finally somewhat spoke English. You just have to learn their little derelicts, uh, I mean dialects, the, and their the ways that they, you know, the, the bloats and the, well, there are tons of words that the, the Aussies use, but 